Misa, Bamelech Echad. The story, there was one king. Shayalo Shisha Banim Uvat Echad. He had six sons and one daughter. Ota Abat Hayatai Chashuva Be'enab Me'od. This daughter was very precious in his eyes. Vaya Mechabba Be'yoter. So, so precious to him. Vaya Mesha'ashe'a Imam Me'od. And he would delight in her very much. Pa'am Echad. One time. Haya Mitaved Ima Be'yachar Ezayom. He was alone with her one day. Benaseh Baro Gezaleha. And he became angry with her. V'nizraka mepiv dibur. And was thrown out from his mouth speech. Shalot tov yikach otach. That the no good one should take you away. Balayla halcha lechadra. At night time the king went to go check on her. Uvaboker lo yadoa chichan hi. And in the morning he didn't know where she was. This is what we've done so far together. And now we're going to understand something that's very consoling, something that's very deep, something that's hard to understand. Vaya viha mitzaer me'od. And it was that his father was very much in pain. Va'alach levaksha ane ve'ana. And he was walking, searching. Where is she? Where is she? What does it mean that he was in so much pain? Because on the one hand, we know that it's only because the father, the king, got upset with the princess that she's in this predicament that she's now, so to speak, lost. And on the other hand, the father appears to be the one who can't be consoled, who is tremendously upset, sad and hurt, in pain, mitzta'er, that's to be in a deep state of pain. He was deeply pained. Ki Hashem Yiparach avinu av harachaman. Because Hashem Yiparach is our father. He is the av harachaman. When we speak about Hashem, the Arizal says that the main quality of Hashem, the one in which he created the world for, for us to experience, is that he's full of compassion. And anybody who's compassionate, who sees that another person is in pain, it pains them. All the more so one's child. And all the more so, even though you're not supposed to have favorites, this king does have a favorite. It's his daughter. And when he sees that as a result of him, she's in so much pain, he's in so much pain as a result. That Hashem Himself is in so much pain from every single Jew that their mind has fallen, that their das has become weakened. And now that Jew, their child, their daughter, his daughter, is now in tremendous amounts of pain. This mystery is alluded to in two Mesechets, Mesechet Hagiga and Mesechet Sanhedrin. That in the time that a person from the Jewish people is in pain, Shekhinah Ma'omeret, the Shekhinah, what does she say? Kalani Meroshi, Oi, my head. Kalani Mi Zeroi, Oi, my arm. That even though Hashem Himself knows that everything that He did to His daughter is for the good. Because in truth, He's delighting tremendously from His child while they are in this descent. However, nevertheless, who meets the heir? Regardless, he's in a tremendous amount of pain. Because from the perspective of us, we're lost. So here's a very, very deep Indian. How could it be that Hashem's in so much pain over what's going on with us, even though He's the one who caused it? And we know that there is this principle that's coming through that everything that Hashem does is for the best. So then how could Hashem be in pain? 
He's in pain because we're in pain. Like the Shekhinah says, Oi my head, oi my arm. Because in that case, we're his head, so to speak, down here. We're his arm down here. So he's in pain because we're in pain. You know, when you see, let's say, for instance, a grandfather, or even me as a teacher, you know, I have students who come to me who are, let's say, 15 years younger than me, and they're talking to me about things that are causing them tremendous pain, and I've been there. And I know that in truth, this is only going to bring them to the ultimate good, not because of some spiritual, uh, high-level, transcendent matter, but because I see that this is what caused me in the past to take new steps, to achieve that closeness, to start to speak to Hashem, to start to ascend in my observance of the mitzvot, to start to develop a deeper, more genuine relationship with Him. Because really, Be'emet, the only cause of the struggle, of the sadness, of the suffering, is a lack of amuna. Rabbi Nachman says that all suffering is coming from a chesron and amuna. And what is amuna? Amuna is tefillah. So therefore, what is the challenge of my life causing me to do? Talk to Him more. And talking is replacing the suffering. Why? Because the suffering is coming from a lack of amuna, meaning a lack of tefillah. And the challenge itself is bringing me to pray more. So through this itself, I'm finding the purpose of my life and the joy of my life. This is why the majority of Breslov or Hasidim, even though they connect to Rabbi Nachman through very difficult um, circumstances, they come out not just back where they were before, they reach a place that they never thought they would be. A state of simcha, a state of joy, that literally, not just are they happy, that they do mitzvot and literally it causes them joy. I put tefillin on and I'm mamish happy. I helped another person, another Jew, and I'm mamish happy. I said a kind word to another person, I'm literally happy. Or let's say I didn't do any of those things like we learned last lesson. I just am a Jew. I'm just happy. I never had that before. My happiness before was completely conditional. But all of that came from this Eureka for the sake of an Aliyah. Now, I know this because I've been there and I see that this is what's going to happen as well. Thank Bezrat Hashem to my students. But that doesn't mean I'm not in pain for them because they're in pain. So even though Hashem, so to speak, is the one who brought us to the place of no good, He knows it's for the sake of an Aliyah that we're going to reach a higher place because of this, a place that we want in our deepest will because of this. But that doesn't mean he's not in pain because we are in pain right now. We are struggling right now. We don't have that amuna yet. And so as a result of that, we feel lost. And because we are sitting in a state of tsar, in a state of pain, so is Hashem. And that's what it means that the father was in a lot of pain after he was the one who sent her to the place of no good. And this is the deepest comfort ever. You know, we think that after that happens, okay, so now we're waiting for Mashiach to come. And until then, I have no idea where Hashem is. Yeah? And, and it's causing me tremendous pain to be so alone. And yet Rabbi Nachman's coming to tell us, no, He doesn't just send us away. He then proceeds to look for us. Va'alach levaksha. He's searching for us. This is what it says in Masech Chulin. So this is a very famous Gemara. It's a very perplexing Gemara. It's something that requires tremendous meditation and his bodhidus to think about. But it fits in exactly with what we've learned so far in this story. That after we learned that Hashem shrunk the moon, that He told the moon, go diminish yourself, go lose yourself. And we know that the moon represents the lost princess, represents our amuna or represents our ability to be besimcha, to be happy. So even though he told her to shrink herself, many people don't know the rest of this Gemara. Afterwards, he then sees that the moon is in tremendous pain, so to speak. And he comes to her and he tries to placate her, to reconciliate. And he says to her, but don't worry, my daughter, because even though you're shrunk, that's the cause of days and years. Meaning that all of the months are going to be anointed from you because we know that the Jewish calendar is based on the moon, right? 
our whole concept of time and space is based on the moon, whereas most calendars of most peoples is coming from the sun. So on the one hand, <clears throat> the moon was shrunk, right? Hashem himself shrunk the moon. And on the other hand, Hashem is saying, but through you, existence of the world is going to take place. You're going to be the cause of time and space. You're going to be the cause of the spiritual journey. The fact that you have taken the sacrifice to diminish yourself, you are going to be celebrated as a result of this. And all this is alluded to by the fact that the Jewish calendar is anointed based on the moon. However, she wasn't comforted from this. Just like we, even though we're going through this Yerida and Hashem says it's for the good, you know, in the end you're going to be able to celebrate and people are going to um, revere you for having gone through this very difficult, very heroic journey, but we're not placated. So what does he say to the moon? The tzaddikim are going to call in your name. Last night after I said uh, Arvit, I went outside, I said Berkat we do a bracha on the moon, right? We know that for the Jewish people, there's a bracha, there's a mitzvah to go outside when the moon is starting to renew itself. There's a blessing that we make on the moon. Why do we do that? Because Rav Natan teaches in the beginning of Lekut HaLachot based on the teachings of Rabbi Nachman in the 282nd lesson of Lekut Moran, Reish Pei Bet, the famous lesson of Azamra that one of the three mitzvahs that was given to the Jewish people in Mitzrayim, even before we left Mitzrayim, most of them were given at Har Sinai, like we just had Shavuot, to give us the Torah. But there were three that were given while we were in Mitzrayim. And Rav Natan brings out the fact that the reason we were given these in Mitzrayim is because we wouldn't leave if not for these three mitzvahs. Because Hashem, yes, He wanted to bring us to Har Sinai. He wanted to bring us to this very high spiritual level. And at the same time, He understood if He didn't give us a little taste first, if he didn't give us a little hope first, a little light first, we weren't going to make it to Har Sinai. So he had to give us something in Mitzrayim. Mitzrayim represents the place of Mitzarim, to be in sar, to be in pain, to be suffering. That's the place of Mitzrayim, that my mind is constricted, like we're speaking about. The moon has been diminished. So what was the first mitzvah we were given? Rosh Chodesh. That very same moon, which we now know is the cause of our pain, that she was diminished the first mitzvah given to us in the Torah is go anoint the moon. Go celebrate the moon. It's an amazing thing. It's tremendous chizik. Hashem doesn't forget about anything. There's so many mitzvot in the Torah that seem to make more sense and connect more to the Jewish way. Spirituality, which is based on the belief in one God. And yet, on the other hand, <clears throat> the first mitzvah we do is to, so to speak, um, celebrate this created figure called the moon. It, it seems to be antithetical to the Torah, to Judaism. For sure, it doesn't seem like the first mitzvah that should be given. However, in a very deep way, Hashem is teaching us that the whole cause for the mitzvah to begin with, the whole ability for the Jewish people to achieve this level at Har Sinai, was to be able to go down the ability to diminish herself. And so Hashem says, go celebrate her first because she's a hero. And so to all of us, you know, I, I, I get so many emails, so many texts, so many phone calls from people um, across the world now, struggling tremendously. And you could just like, from the outside looking in, you can read this email and cry but the greatest source of tears comes from the fact that this person doesn't know that they're a hero. How they've struggled for so many years, how they're going through so many things, how they have uh, dealt with challenges and obstacles that they could have never foreseen, that they're now seemingly, you know, in their own mind, just holding on. But the things that they said that they've went through, the things that they said they've been challenged by, the fact that they made this decision, this courageous decision, that in the face of all of this, to continue trying to talk to Hashem, trying to connect to Him, trying to elevate, trying to be as genuine as possible in their spiritual journey. And the thing that comes through, through every email, through every text, through every phone call, is this person's a hero. 
And just like the lost princess, why is she suffering so much? Because she feels lost. But a person who sees, looks from the outside like Hashem, is saying, she's not lost. Go celebrate her. Because the beginning of you leaving behind your exile is the celebration of the good, is the celebration of the moon. The fact that she can renew, she can start over again. The fact that she was diminished, that is her heroism. And still she was not comforted, even after Hashem said, but the tzaddikim are going to call on your name, meaning every month the Jewish people are going to go outside and we're going to say in the schut of the moon, in the merit of the moon, and even at the end of this, we say, David Melech Yisrael, Chai Vikayam, we jump up, we dance. Why do we say David Melech Yisrael, Chai Vikayam? It's literally in the liturgy, specifically for this, not for anything else. Because the whole concept of Mashiach is the concept of the moon. That she is the moon figure. The Mashiach is this moon figure. And therefore we understand by looking at the moon that even though it was so dark and you couldn't see any light, but now you see a little tiny bit of light and we start to dance. Why? Because we know from this that she is going to be renewed. One day she is going to be renewed. Like the Pasuk says, if you look at Chabad's uh, liturgy in terms of Birkat Elevena, it says at the end, it brings a Pasuk. The Pasuk says that on that day, they're going to be searching for Hashem their God and David their king. Don't forget, yes, right now, it seems very bleak. Yes, right now, it seems like the world is completely upside down. But look at the moon when the light starts to come on a little bit. And know that through this little bit of light, the whole thing is going to start over again. Just like within you, Rabbi Nachman says, you're struggling, you feel low, you're having a difficulty in your life. All you have to do is focus on a little bit of good inside of yourself. And once you find that little bit of good, say it out loud. And once you say it, you might not resonate it with it as real. It might not feel genuine to you, or it might feel mixed with other type of dross, other type of negativities, other type of motivations. So find another piece of good. Say it out loud and keep doing this. What are you doing? You're finding the light in the beginning, the light that renews the moon. And when you find enough light, you'll be able to start over again because you're going to create a song, Rabbi Nachman says. And we know who is the sweet singer of the Jewish people. It's King David. So now the depths of what Rabbi Nachman is teaching is why is he the sweet singer? Because the essence of a song is to extract light from darkness. It's to actively look for good in the dark. Like Rabbi Nachman teaches that when a person makes a song, what is he doing? He's taking a musical scale and he's picking positive notes from negative notes. Now, if there was no negative notes, there would be no music, Rabbi Nachman teaches. It's the ability to choose positive notes from negative notes that creates songs. So too, King David, who is specifically the sweet singer of the Jewish people, this is his mila, this is what makes him unique. And the essence of David is not just that he's another tzaddik, but he's the Mashiach himself. And so in our waiting for him to come, we also have to access that figure within ourself. And that comes from becoming sweet singers. How do we become sweet singers? We need to be able to actively force ourselves to search for and find the good amongst the dark. And when you pick out one point, it's like picking out a note. And then you pick out another point, it's like picking out another note. And when you pick out enough good points, you create a song. And don't think to yourself, oh, I wish I didn't have any negative, any challenge, any obstacles in my life. Because that's what makes the song the song. It's the fact that it makes sense. It sounds good amidst the dark notes that I've decided to discard those notes, not to pay attention to those notes, but focus on the positive notes that came from the backdrop of that darkness. That's the only place that a song can come from. And this is alluded to by the Pasuk that says that by daytime, Hashem is going to command His kindness. And at nighttime, we're going to sing to Hashem. That tefillah le'el chayai, tefillah to Hashem is my life, right? Why is it during the day Hashem is commanding His kindness, but at night is a time of song? I would think that daytime is a time of song. Because daytime is a time of clarity. Daytime is a time of joy. Daytime is a time of life force. 
But no, King David says the time to sing is at nighttime. Because the only ability to create music, to create your groove, to create your song, your theme song, okay, this can only be had in the darkness. It's that backdrop that the stars shine. But still the moon is not consoled. Just like we, even though with all this chizik that we continue to get from Rabbi Nachman, there's this irking, there's this, there's, there's, there's this, um, this feeling, this, this, this aching inside that's not leaving us. So this is a very old story, in fact. Ad shamar karash baruch hu habi'u alei kapara al shmi'iti at yerech. This is very deep. <laughs> when was the moon finally consoled? When Hashem said, I'm sorry. When Hashem brought his own korban and he asked for kapara, that his action should be atoned for, for diminishing the moon. And it's brought in the 10th Torah of Lekut Moran. Shazehu Shorash HaTshuva. This is the entire root of tshuva. This is the entire source of our ability to be able to um, move beyond our past errors and to grow and elevate to a higher place from the error itself. How are we able to do this thing called tshuva? So Rabbi Nachman brings a very deep thing. It comes from this original primordial event because Hashem was the first one ever to do teshuva, so to speak. That even though he knows that what he did is for the very best, he still says he's sorry because he sees how much pain that the moon is in. Because through this Hashem revealed, Rabbi Nachman teaches, that Hashem takes full responsibility for all of our descents, for all of our fallings for the Jewish people in this world. Because they're all the hishtashalut, they're all the result of Hashem telling the moon, go diminish yourself. And at the time that they come <clears throat> back to him with love, that when the Jewish people come back to Hashem, but through love, because they want to, because they yearn for him, because they deeply, deeply feel that they're missing something, and they're willing to go against the whole world in order to connect to Hashem despite everything that I've been through, that's called teshuva me'ahava, teshuva from love. And then a wondrous thing takes place. Hashem takes all of your prior lackings, all of your prior errors, and all of the challenges that you have been through in your life, and the most wondrous way turns them all into this sweet merit. Like Rabbi Nachman says, that the greatness of Hashem is that He can take all of the maniot of your life all of the challenges of your life and turn them into ne'imot, which is the same letters flipped around. Meniot ne'imot. He can take all of the obstacles and challenges of your life and turn them into ne'imot, to bliss, to ecstasy, to flip the whole thing. What's the source of, so to speak, Hashem's ability to do this? It's the fact that Hashem asked for kapara after He asked for the moon to shrink. Because in reality, Hashem doesn't want the moon to be small. But He knows that in order for us, so to speak, to be able to take the steps that we want to in our life, to achieve that level of independence, to achieve that experience of inner strength, to have our own orientation to life and to Hashem, that we could have a real relationship, He needed to be separated from us. But don't think for one second, that even though you don't see Him, He's not sa'ar me'od. He's not in a tremendous amount of pain while he's actively searching for us. Uvizman shehem shabaim alav me'ahava, right? It flips to good. Ufiyus halevana, and he's constantly placating the moon. Mishtal shalapiu shahashem yiparach lenefeshot Yisrael. Just like all the time, he's trying to placate the Jewish people. 
all on all of these dark and filthy places that we have been to in our life, that we're currently experiencing in our life, Hashem is also saying sorry. Like it says in Yerushalmi and Tanit, if a person comes up to you and in an antagonistic way says to you, where's your God? Because the Jewish people had just had the Beit HaMikdash burned down and they left Israel in the most horrifying, most traumatic way, in chains, having been slaughtered and brought out of Eretz Israel, out of their glory and into this horrifying place that they had just been crushed by, the place of Rome. And we're still in this exile. The exile of Rome has not ended yet. And the Gemara is saying something which is so poignant because the Chazal understood even 2,000 years ago, this is the last exile. So when they said this, they meant this forever until the Mashiach comes. If someone comes to you and says to you, why do you believe in God? Look at the place that you're in. Look at the place that the Jewish people are in. There's no proof. There's no evidence. There's nothing that corroborates the fact that Hashem exists or that He cares about you. Where's your God? And the Gemara there in Tanit, in the Yoshami says, <clears throat> Tell him. He's in the great city of Rome. Very deep. Say he's in the darkest place. If someone comes to you and says to you, Where is Hashem? I don't see him in Eretz Israel. The Beit HaMikdash is destroyed. It doesn't appear to be that your God, who is the God of Israel, is in the land of Israel. Say to him, you're right. He's not in those sweet, lofty, enjoyable places anymore. He's with me in Rome. He's in the great city of Rome. Just like it says about the Mashiach, that when Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi saw him, he was bandaging the sick people in Rome. Why is Mashiach in Rome? Why in the Midrash do they bring the fact that the Mashiach is going to start in Rome before he gets to Eretz Israel? He's going to start in Western civilization before he actually makes it to the place of Kedusha and Tahara, to the place of spirituality. Why does he begin in Rome? Why does it say that Hashem found David in stone? Stone was a horrifying place. Stone was a place where if you gave charity, they burned you alive. Because they didn't want to encourage any type of selfless acts. Because that would ruin their society, which was built on these goals of money and wealth and superiority and higher rank. David starts there. He is born in that place. Because the answer is that Hashem is with us in Rome. Oh, and furthermore, in Alicha, what does it mean that, that the king is walking? He's walking and he's asking where she is. It could have just said... Where is she? Shashem Yibarach Mashpia Bechina Torah Shebenister. So Rabbi Nachman teaches in the 10th Torah of Lukut Moran as well. That when the Jewish people are in a state of exile, then something interesting takes place. We don't have revealed Torah, right? Because we're not learning it, because we're struggling. Either we're struggling after the fact, meaning we found Hashem in our life, and we can't get ourselves to learn because we just feel too low. Or, on the other hand, we grew up completely secular, we never even heard of the Torah, or it's like a storybook to us. So we never learned it. However, Rabbi Nachman teaches there's no life force except for the life force that comes from Torah. So what's a Jew's life force in exile if he's not learning Torah? Because it's seemingly, he shouldn't be alive. Rabbi Nachman makes this point many, many times. All life force comes from wisdom, the wisdom of the Torah. And if there's no wisdom of the Torah in a specific place, that place, that circumstance, that person cannot exist. So then how is it that the 80% of the Jewish world is completely secular, does not learn the Torah? How do they exist? Or how even within the religious world do you have people who they're just going through a period in which they're struggling and therefore they can't pick up the Torah. How do they exist? So Rabbi Nachman teaches something unbelievable. That there is something called real Torah and there's something called hidden Torah. And when a Jew is in this space that we just spoke about, then Hashem imbues his soul, his life with hidden Torah. Now the paradox is hidden Torah is higher than revealed Torah. 
Now, what's the reason we don't experience Hashem in that place? Because He's hidden in that place. But on the other hand, that which is hidden is always more cogent, it's always more powerful than that which is revealed. And this is the secret of the Gemara that says that a tzaddik cannot stand in the same place as the Balchuva. Why? Because the tzaddik only has revealed Torah. But the Balchuva has hidden Torah. So therefore, when the Balchuva is able to find the teachings of the tzaddik Yesod Olam, he's able to cultivate a muna in the darkness. He's able to find his song amidst the backdrop of the night then he's able to actually reveal a level of Torah which is hidden, which is superior, which is elevated, which a person would not be able to know if he was not there. And that is that Hashem is in Rome. But how could Hashem be in Rome? The Romans were terrorists. Hashem is there also. But we went through so much horrifying things in Rome. Hashem was there also. If they ask you, where is Hashem your God? Tell him he's with me in my darkness. That's where he is. He's not in Eretz Yisrael, so to speak. He's with me in my suffering. Like the Pasuk says, I'm with him when he's suffering. That's where he is. Shederech midat haraglin. And Rabbi Nachman teaches in that Torah that revealed Torah is the concept of the hands. Why? Because you notice that everybody's hands are um, revealed, right? It might seem like an uh, innocuous point or it's, it's just not uh, relevant to anything. However, it's a very deep thing because everything Rabbi Nachman says has meaning. What's the reason that in general, obviously this is a different generation, but in general, over the course of history, no matter what level of clothing people wore, or how much they concealed themselves with their clothing, there's something that's always been available that we can always see. That's a person's hands. Why? Because Rabbi Nachman says the hands represent revealed Torah, or the concept of Mordechai, Rabbi Nachman says. But now we have the feet, or the legs, or the thighs. Now those are covered over by clothing. They're concealed. They're hidden within shoes, within pants, within dresses, within clothing. You don't see them, but they're there. That's the concept of hidden Torah. And Rabbi Nachman says this is the concept of Esther. That we see Hester comes from the word Hester, which means hidden. Whereas Mordechai comes from the word Mordror, which means revealed Malchut. That's what it means. That Hashem is revealed to you. You experience Hashem in your life, just like the Tzaddik sees Hashem in everything that takes place. But Esther, the Balchuva, the one who's in the darkness, she doesn't see Hashem. She's, it's hidden for her. And yet, in a very deep way, the Torah of Esther is higher, Rabbi Nachman says, than the Torah of Mordechai. Why? Because it's hidden Torah. It's the secrets of Torah. But it's only when Esther is able to develop the courage and the strength through the teachings of Mordechai to say, Ani Yehudi, I'm a Jew. To tell the king, even though the king is threatening the demise of her people, that she gets up and she fights for the Jewish people and she fights for her Judaism. And she says, I'm a Jew. Then all of a sudden, all of the darkness of Esther's life starts to flip. And all of these seemingly um, challenging, all of these seemingly um, traumatic situations that took place for her life and the life of her people, it was all flipped and shown that this was the greatest good. She revealed all of the Torah that was hidden in those places. That's the concept of the feet. And we know that our generation is called Igvete de Mashiach. We are called the footsteps of Mashiach. So in the past, we've discussed the fact that the footsteps relate to the fact that this is going to be a dark time because the feet are in the place of darkness. Like it says that her feet descend to death, right? The feet is the place of no feeling the spirituality, the heel. You can't feel anything physically in the heel. But on the other hand, we're saying a myla of the heel now. We're saying something that's a, a benefit of the heel. That is that she's concealed. She's holding on to hidden Torah. She's Esther. And it's beschut. It's in the merit of Esther, Rabbi Nachman says. It's primarily through Esther that the Geula takes place, not through Mordechai. Because the hidden Torah is what needs to be revealed before redemption can take place. 
And this is the secret of when the Mashiach spoke to the Baal Shem Tov, and this very famous conversation, which is repeated over by the students of Hasidut from all over, constantly. But the Baal Shem Tov said to the Mashiach, when are you coming? And he says, when your teachings go forth, forth when your teachings spread out throughout the world, meaning Hasidut, your special expression of Torah, the one which reveals that I'm in Rome, the one that reveals that, is, that I am hidden in the darkness, that I'm in pain while you're in pain, that you actually experience that and you can experience the joy from knowing that we're in this together. When those teachings go forth, the Mashiach says, I'm going to reveal myself to the world. And this is primarily on us. This is on the feet. Because the tzaddik, the one who grows up religious, he cannot explain to the Baal Tshuva that Hashem was with him in everything that he went through. Because it's not going to resonate with us. We're not going to feel that. But if all of a sudden there's a light like Esther that comes from the darkness itself and can express to everybody that Hashem is with us in Rome, now this level of Torah, the revealing of hidden Torah, this is going to set the world on fire. This is going to bring the Geula. This is going to bring the redemption. Why? Because we see that they descend and they reach to this place that's so far. Like it says in Mishlei, like we just said, that her legs descend to death. Speaking about Malchut, speaking about the lost princess, speaking about Amuna, speaking about Simcha, that her feet descend to death, meaning that the most vulnerable aspect of a Jew's psyche is their faith. It's constantly waxing and waning because she's the closest to the klipot. If you look at the ten svirot, you'll notice that these are the ten functions or the ten powers of the soul, we'll say simply. Right? We have a muna at the bottom. What's the um, lesson that we get from Amuna being at the bottom of these ten powers? Because she's right above the klipot, because right up below the ten svirot, you have the realm of the Sitra Achra. So the teaching that comes out of here very simply is that the Malchut Amuna is constantly descending into the place of the Sitra Achra and needing to be pulled out. Descending again and needing to be pulled out. Just like a Jew every single day seemingly is going through these tests of faith where I'm like, I feel it. I, I, I realize Hashem's with me. I believe it. I'm, I experience it. But then the next moment, you see that your faith went into exile. Where did it go? It was captured again. The princess became lost again. Why does Hashem keep doing this? Why does He keep telling me to minimize myself? Because there are sparks of godliness in the Sitra Achron. That Hashem is in Rome. Like Hashem said to Moshe, come to Paro. He should have said, go to Paro. Why is he saying, come to Paro? Right? He told Abraham, lech lecha, go to Eretz Yisrael. But when he said to come to Mitzrayim, he didn't say go to Mitzrayim, he says come to Mitzrayim. Nobody says come unless they're telling the person that I'm there. It's mashma, it's implicit in come versus go. Go means go find something. Come means I'm there. So the paradox is that Hashem told Moshe, come to Paro because you're looking for me, but I'm not in this place of elevation. I'm in the place of Paro. <clears throat> I'm in the place of Mitzrayim. I'm in the great city of Rome. And it's through this that Hashem calls out to us. Don't think to yourself that you're lost. Rather, I descended with you. I am dwelling with you. So where is he? He's in every single good thing that you do. He's in every good desire that you have. That you're doing this for Hashem's honor. And what's the proof? Because it's not easy for you. It's not convenient for you. We know that when the Mashiach comes, there's not going to be converts anymore. Why is there not going to be converts anymore? Because Rabbi Nachman teaches that the whole entire spiritual journey, the whole value of it, 
is that we choose it when it's hard. That if we chose it when it was easy, there could be ulterior motives. We might not be doing it really because we want to connect to Hashem. We're doing it just because it's easy, right? You see many uh, sports teams. Nobody cares about them at all. Nobody's interested. You have like a group of small fans. They go to every game. They buy every piece of merchandise. They're made fun of by all their friends. They have to endure all of these losing seasons. And then all of a sudden, they draft one player. They go to the championship. And the whole world is busy with this team. Oh, and they start wearing their clothing. And they attend the games. And they tweet out their, their pictures and their logos. They speak about them on TV. They call them fair weather fans. Now, if you think to yourself, man, I wish I, I could have just been like that, right? I wish I didn't have to go through all those things. But if you really think about it, who's getting real nachat from their team's success? The one who bared all of the, the burden, all of the difficulty of being with that team while they were struggling for those decades. And now they finally win the championship. Or this person who just sees that it's easy now, who sees that they're the winner, and therefore I want to be with them. They don't get real nachat from this team. They're not really happy. They're just joining the bandwagon. But the ones who get real nachat for the rest of their life, even if they only won one championship, is that team that for 20 losing years, and they were the laughing stock of the community, but they didn't give up on what they believed in. Then, like my Rebbe used to say, the... Uh, the final scene has not taken place yet, right? The movie's not over yet. So when the movie ends and we see really how everything was for the good and the Jewish people really are the Ikar of the world and that Hashem loves us with an infinite love and He came down with us and it was only for our good that we can lift up all of the godliness, all of the light which is trapped in this darkness, that we can pick out all these Nekudo Tovot, all of these good points, that are amidst the uh, backdrop of the nighttime, and we can make music, like the Jewish people are called the Israel. If you change letters around, it spells Shir Kel, the song of Hashem, because the whole essential quality of a Jew is he's able to make music. Some might say, well, David, your voice is terrible. You're right. <laughs> but I do know how to make music. You know why? Because I'm a Jew. Because I've been through a lot in my life. But it's the ichor of a Jew to be able to find the good from that darkness. And when you find all of those good points, you string together music, you make that song. Just like Yaakov Avinu when he's struggling with Esav. Literally, Esav is giving him hell his whole life. You would think at some point he would relent. No, he comes at him harder. The closer he gets to the goal, the more Esav's coming after him. Until the point that Esau literally just throws him on the floor. And at the very last moment that it looks like Yaakov is done, he flips him. And Esau says to him, let me go. Yaakov says, not until you bless me. And he says back to him, okay, fine. Your name's not really Yaakov. You're not really the heel. It's just what it looked like. You're Yisrael. You're the one who fights with the divine and you win. And that name Yisrael is Shir Kel, the song of Hashem. You're not really Yaakov, you're not really the heel. You're really the head. However, you need to go through this experience of feeling like the heel, that you can make a song. Because that song is what allows you to overcome all of the difficulties and challenges in your life. Rabbi Nachman says in, uh, in his teachings that it's very good for a person to walk around humming a song in their head, just to hum it out loud. Always have a song. Now the simple understanding is the song is, you know, some nice song, happy song that makes me feel good. And that's, that's uh, and therefore it'd be good for you because it's gonna help you feel happy. But the depth is you should always have a song because if you do, it means you're always focused on the good points. The good points that specifically come from the challenges of your life. And through that, you're making music. And if you're doing that, you're achieving the purpose of your life. And Hashem says, I am having tremendous nachat from you, specifically because you chose to go down to this place and you still want me. 
Zebechinat vehalach. That's what it means that the king is going, he's walking to find you. Halach hu bechinat raglin. It's the concept of the feet. And the concept of the feet is the concept of that which descends to death, meaning she comes down to Rome with us. Hashem is with us here. Umikoch halicha azu shal Hashem yiparach. Nitorim atzadikim. And it's through the strength of Hashem, so to speak, coming down here with us, the concept of the feet, that the tzaddikim are aroused, their feet, to walk to far places, to travel to distant lands, to awaken and to empower the souls of the Jewish people. That even though we're struggling, that they arouse us to want to come closer to Hashem, even amidst the difficulty itself. You know, sometimes people will say to me, I don't see Hashem anywhere in my life. I don't see Him anywhere. You keep talking about it over and over and over again, but I really don't see it at all. But that's all because we're waiting for some flying, you know, magnificent creature in space to come down and say, um, I'm here. And we don't realize, like Rabbi Nachman teaches in the first Torah of the Kutimran, that you have to look for the Chochmah in everything, meaning you have to find how Hashem is hidden in every aspect of your life. Did you ever notice that for so many years you felt so lost and then something happened and then you realized that Hashem exists and the Torah is real and you want to be a Jew, but you're still lost and confused and then all of a sudden you pick up one of the Svarim of Breslov, you pick up one of the Sefers or you heard a video of a class teaching about Rabbi Nachman. And for the first time, you feel this tremendous chizik, you feel this tremendous encouragement, you feel this hope, you feel this empowerment. And now you're spending years with Rabbi Nachman encouraging you, empowering you, telling you, don't give up. Ain't shum yeush ba'olam kal. There's no such thing as despair in the world. Ko'olam kulo, geshert tsar o. The whole entire world is a very narrow bridge. Haikar, the essence is, the klal, the rule is, not to be afraid at all. Who do you think is telling you that? There is no Rabbi Nachman. There is no Moshe Rabbeinu. It's only Hashem. He's encouraging you through the tzaddikim. The tzaddikim have went to the furthest, darkest places to lift us out because that's Hashem Himself within them. So if you want to know where's my encouragement coming from, where should I really see that Hashem is with me, that He hasn't given up on me, that He cares about me, that He's constantly pulling for me? Just look in front of your face. Is someone screaming at you, encouraging you? Is someone telling you, don't give up? Is someone fighting tooth and nail for you, praying day and night, figuring out new ways to try to give you lessons, to try to give you um, stories, to try and give you empowerment, that you should be able to move beyond the darkness of your life? That person doesn't exist in front of you. It's Hashem. Where is he in the darkness with me? He's with the tzaddikim. Like Rashi says on the Pasuk, that we have a mitzvah to have the vekut with Hashem. It's a mitzvah der right that we need to have clinging with Hashem. So Rashi says there, the simple explanation of the commentator, what does it mean to have the vacant with something which is not physical? How do I cling to something which has no time and space? So Rashi says the pshat is by spending time with Talmidei Chachamim. By being close to Tzadikim, you're going to be able to have the vacant with Hashem. Why should I be able to have closeness with Hashem by connecting myself to Tzadikim? So the explanation is because the Shekhinah is with the Tzadikim. Now think about it. Who is the one who's trying so hard to help you? It's the tzaddikim. It's not the random person on the street. It's the tzaddik. The tzaddik is literally going to the depths of hell to try to help you get out of that place and to give you hope and to give you comfort and to give you faith and to give you empowerment and courage. And he doesn't stop. No matter what you go through, no matter how many times you fall, no matter how bleak it gets, he continues to fight for you. Why? Because Hashem is fighting for you through the tzaddik, through these tzaddikim, that they are traveling, that they're not living lives of comfort, they're not living lives of wealth. They're waking up very early in the morning to cry over the loss of the Beit HaMikdash. They are traveling from city to city, 
for the sake of a few Jewish people to teach them Torah, that they're deciding not to engage in more and more individual growth, but instead they're focused on trying to help the Klal, because that's Hashem in the darkness. He is enclothing himself within the Siddiqim himself because the Shekhinah is what's possessing them to do this. She's down there with us. And what we're going to learn in the next lesson is there's a new character on the scene. It's not anymore just the king and the six sons and the one daughter. But now that the daughter is lost, we're going to see that there's one heroic figure who comes on the scene. His name is the Mishnah Lamelech, the second to the king. Or what they say in English is the Viceroy. And in the story, this is the king's best friend. And as soon as the king's best friend sees how much pain that the king is in, looking for his daughter, he says, where is she? I'm going to go find her. Give me these things, and no matter how long it takes, I'm going to go until I find her. And that's the true tzaddikim. Like Rabbi Nachman said in his lifetime, he told his students, I had no reason to come back down again. Most people, we come back down because we need to fix something. Rabbi Nachman is saying, there was no reason for me to come back down. I came back down for you. Because the Shekhinah is in the dust. Because the tzaddikim are not satisfied unless Hashem's daughter is back with the king, because the tzaddikim really know how much pain the king is in for the fact that the children are so estranged. And this should be our greatest comfort, because what is it that's causing them to feel this tremendous desire that they're willing to give up everything to go down to help us? They're even willing to come back to this physical world and go through the trials and tribulations of being alive in this world, just so that we would have what we need. Because it's, it is the rutzon of Hashem, it's the desire of Hashem, it's the spirit of Hashem that's infused them to the point that they want what Hashem wants only. So if you see that the true tzaddikim are willing to go through so much to help us, that is our chizik in the darkness. That is our proof that Hashem hasn't given up, that He's looking for us, He's searching for us. Because you know that there are these tzaddikim that they won't give up, they don't stop texting me, they don't stop calling me, they don't stop encouraging me. That's Hashem. And what we're going to see is that's the reason why the Mishnah Melech says that I'm going to go through the deserts and I'm going to go through the fields and I'm going to go through the forests until I find her. And I'm not going to give up until that point. The king says, where is she? Why these two concepts of where is she, where is she? So there's a pasuk in Shir Shirim. It says, I am going to my beloved, the, be the most beautiful of women. Where is the face or the countenance of your beloved? We're going to search for her with you. Okay? Meaning to say, The Tikkuni Zohar says, The true secret is that Hashem never leaves the Shekhinah. That even though it looks like they're estranged and they're separated, the truth is He never actually leaves her, the Zohar says. And in the time that the Shekhinah descends to exile, he descends with her and he settles with her. That's why it says that we're going to search for her with you. Why with you? Because he is already with her. Because when a person desires to go find Hashem in their life, he automatically is attaching himself with Hashem. The fact that he wants Hashem, so Hashem is there. Because in every good point in your life, in every good desire, in every good action, in every good thought, in every positive emotion that you have, Hashem is with you in that. So as long as you want Hashem, you're with the Shekhinah. Because the Shekhinah is with the one who's searching for Him. 
וזהו כמו שניפר מקודם, שגם בזמן שכינה בגלות אצל הלא טוב, that even when the שכינה goes down into the place of no good, הקרש ברוך הוא עומד אמה בקשר נסתר, השם is attached to her in a hidden concealed way, הוא ממשיך לחבב אותו, and is drawing his love for her, להשתעשע and his delight from her, אפילו יותר ממקודם, even more so than he had previous to her going down to the place of no good. אלא שאז הוא בעולם גדול. Only the fact that it's in a tremendous state of concealment that we don't realize this. והקריבו הזי, הזו היא אבודה מהם. And this closeness appears lost to the princess. We feel that it's lost. בעזרת השם, next lesson. <clears throat> We're going to see Ahmad Asheni Lamalchut. The second to the king stands up and says, Give me money, give me clothes, give me a horse, give me a servant, and I'm going to go find the princess. No matter how long it takes me, no matter how much I have to go through, no matter how many lifetimes I have to come back, the Mishnah Melech says, Give me these things and I'm going to go find her. And we're going to see that the whole story of the lost princess is the second to the king's undomitable will <clears throat> to find us in our place of darkness and to lift us up no matter what. <clears throat> and this is the source of the most tremendous encouragement. And what we're going to find out is that there's a part of us that is the Mishneh Lamelech. There's a part of us that is the second to the king. This part of us that's the second to the king, this is the part of us that's not giving up. This is the part of us that gets us to start over again and again and again. And this is the part of us that Rabbi Nachman is trying to illuminate. The second to the king, the part of us that won't give up on the lost princess. It is the koach of the tzaddik Yisod Olam to encourage us, to illuminate that point of the tzaddik within us, not to give up on the princess, no matter what. Because Rabbi Nachman is going to say, That at the end of the day, Sof calls Sof, he's going to find her. He will find her. But the only ability we have to go do that is through the Mishnah Melech, this second to the king, the one who encourages us to not give up even when it's hard. And if we do so, there's a guarantee that at the end of the day, we will find what we're looking for. Does anybody have any questions from this class? Any questions? Speak or forever hold your peace. So, I, I, have, a, I have a question. Sure. Um, so, how, what, how do we, how can we differentiate between what's, what we want and what Hashem wants? Because, We, can't, we constantly like live our lives wanting certain things or whatever it is and the Shahina whatever it is could want us to be in certain other places and so how, do, how does that actually how, how can we actually um, align good question <clears throat> Rabbi Nachman says that when Hashem really um, feels connected to somebody, that one of his children has decided that they really want to live an authentic life with him. So then, so to speak, you become a part of Hashem's group of best friends. And the nature of anybody's group of best friends is that they let you know what's going on with them, right? Maybe to the outside world, everything looks hunky-dory. But he reveals what he's really feeling to his best friend. So if you see that you, Be'emet, you really want Hashem in your life, and you have taken steps in your life which substantiate that, with, which if you're able to really zoom out for a second and look at where you were 10 years ago, 15 years ago, right? So you could see very clearly you have made tremendous steps and have been through a lot and have overcome a lot and continue to, to try to find Hashem, no matter what that looks like now. So you're one of Hashem's best friends. So now Rabbi Nachman says, well, how does that manifest itself? Because Rabbi Nachman says, when you come to do it, Bodedud, 
and you come to talk to him and you pour your heart out to him about the thing that you're struggling with. Rabbi Nachman says something very deep. <clears throat> those things that you feel, those things that, you praying, that you're praying for, they're actually Hashem's prayers. So that means that when you're praying for the Rafu Shlema of somebody that you love, it's because Hashem is praying for the Rafu Shlema of someone that He loves. And He's doing it through your mouth. So this is something that takes tremendous contemplation, something that's very deep. So if you're sad, it means, so to speak, Hashem is sad. If you're praying to Hashem, Hashem, please heal this person, this person's sick. I need you to help this person. I feel so lost. I feel so confused. I don't know what to do. This person has no connection to you whatsoever, but they need a refuah. They're not going to pray for themselves because they don't even believe in you. I believe in you, but I have yet to see you answer my prayers. I need you to help me. Please help me. Please heal this person. Hashem is praying through you. Rabbi Nachman says that when a person has a pure heart and they come to do Ibodidu, they're praying for the right reasons. They really are coming from a place of selflessness. They're coming from a place of truth. And they pray. Rabbi Nachman says, guaranteed you're going to have Ruach HaKodesh. That Hashem is going to be speaking through your mouth. He's praying through you. So how do I know if I want what Hashem wants? How do I know we're meeting in the same place? And this is what we're learning in this lesson. That if, despite everything that I go through, I still continue to want Hashem, so then I know that's what He wants. If I'm praying for the welfare of my brothers and sisters, so then for sure you need to know that Hashem wants that. Even if, let's say, we learned with Moshe Rabbeinu, with the Jewish people, the Dechet Egel, right? And Hashem says, leave me to Moshe, desist from me. But the Chachamim say that when he said desist from me, Moshe wasn't holding on to him. So why is Hashem saying, let me go? He was trying to hint to Moshe, don't let me go. <laughs> and Moshe wasn't even holding on in the first place. He was trying to say to, to Moshe, you could hold on to me and not let me do this. I want you to hold on to me and not let me do this. Hashem wants you to step up and not to let go of your friends and family, not to stop praying for them. Even for the person who mocks you and who makes fun of you and belittles your connection to Judaism and to spirituality, you don't give up on that person. Hashem wants you to fight for that. When you do so, you can be rest assured that your Ratzon is Hashem's Ratzon. Now, why has it not happened yet then? So for this, we're going to have to wait because the final chapter has yet to be written. But you can know for sure that this is the place where the Ratzon meets up. When you want what Hashem wants, even though you haven't seen it yet in your life, and we know that Hashem wants that His children should be healthy, so if you're praying for that, then you know it's what Hashem wants. So that could be part of your prayer. If I want it, and I know you want it, so then why is it not happening? Turn that into a tefillah. Now, obviously, if you say, you know, Hashem, I really, really, really want the Mets to win the, the pennant this year. It could be Hashem doesn't want that. <laughs> could be he wants another team to win it but if you see in the Torah somewhere that Hashem alludes to the fact that he wants something like for instance that he wants his kids to get married and you see one of your friends is unable to get married but you can be rest assured that even though it hasn't happened yet Hashem wants that because it says it in the Torah so if Hashem wants it and I want it so why hasn't it happened that's what you need to pray about does that make sense, Fed? Yep. Okay, good. Anybody else? What about those years and years of being in darkness before learning about these lessons? What about those sparks from the darkness of the past? That's right, that's the whole entire empowerment of Rebbe Nachman. That he's saying that even that stuff, the stuff from before the spiritual journey, that you're going to see that when you do Teshuvah from love, you're going to see that there was light back then. So this is a very deep thing that I've been learning about. If you look in the Mishnayot, right, this is the source of the Gemara, there's a halachic concept called Berura that is um, clarification. 
But this concept of Beirur is specifically about retroactive clarification. That there is a principle in Jewish law that if after the fact something comes out to corroborate the status of something in the past in a way which doesn't seemingly make any sense, it retroactively clarifies the status of that thing to be what it really is. So I know that, that was a lot of words, but try to follow with me again, okay? Let's say, for instance, a person grows up his whole life, he's not connected to Hashem. He's engaged in many acts and in many uh, um, thoughts, many emotions, many experiences, which seem to go against what the Torah says it wants for you and for the Jewish people and for the world at large. However, in a very deep way, after you do teshuva from love, then your averot becomes schut, they become merits. How is that possible? Through this halachic principle, halachic principle, called retroactive clarification, that somehow through our doing tshuva from love, we see that in fact there were many sparks of godliness that get lifted up retroactively. And this is the whole entire um, uh, wonder of tshuva, that it says that tshuva was created before the world was created. Tshuva is above nature. Why is it above nature? Because nature is in time and space. But tshuva is not. Tshuva has a way of fixing everything. Not right now, even things that happened in the past that are already over. Because they're really not over. Because Hashem doesn't exist in time and space. Hashem's greatness is that He can even go back to the times of before. When there was seemingly no light there. And can transform that to the greatest light itself. That He could reveal the Torah that was hidden in those places of darkness. So yes, actually, in fact, the whole reason you were in those places beforehand is because there were sparks of godliness there. And the greatness of tshuva is that now while you're engaged in it, you're actually lifting up those sparks from what happened previously, even though you're not there anymore. Because the power of tshuva, tshuva is berura, is the retroactive clarification. You can retroactively clarify, meaning extract sparks from before, even though you're not physically there anymore. Okay, so one of the students is bringing up the concept of Eov. We know that Eov was born into the world <clears throat> and he had everything. He had a beautiful wife, he had amazing kids, he had wealth, he had health, literally everything. And not just that, he was a tzaddik. He literally, his whole life was dedicated towards Hashem. But then we see that the Satan comes to Hashem and says, what's the point of his being here? He's already reached the level of a tzaddik. And he has everything that you would want in the physical world. So then what's his purpose of being here? He says, <clears throat> let me test him. Let me challenge him. Right? That's the purpose of being in this world. This world is made for the challenge. I want to see if he's really a tzaddik. Hashem gives haskama. He says, you can challenge him. Don't worry, he's going to win out. And what ends up happening? His wife is taken from him. His kids are taken from him. His wealth is taken from him. His health is taken from him. And we see that even though he goes into a series of questions where he starts to wonder about everything in his life, how could I go through this? And his friends have to come to console him, right? And at the end of the day, it says that he held strong in this very difficult test and Hashem ended up giving it all back. Okay? Where is the love and compassion in that? So first of all, we have to understand, like the last class that I posted for Tzion Breslov, <clears throat> I don't understand and it's okay. Part of being able to allow Hashem into my life is to allow myself to be comfortable with the fact that I don't understand everything. And that my conception of reality doesn't bind Hashem by any means or shape or form. Just because I have a previous conception of what's good and a previous conception of what's not good 
right? Because this has been my perspective of life. This is the only thing that fits into my brain. Only this could be good and only this could not be good. That doesn't mean that Hashem is bound by that. The Rabbi Nachman is teaching that the greatness of Hashem is he can even turn all of Eov's life even after the fact. And he can reveal in retrospect that that was the greatest love. So even when Hashem is uh, uh, acting with us in a way of givura, in a way of um, judgment, still we know that Yitzchak was born from Avraham, right? We know this is an unbelievable thing where <clears throat> it says over and over again, Avraham gave birth to Yitzchak, Yitzchak's the son of Avraham. So all of the sages are trying to figure out what is this double explanation? Why do we need to know two times? Hashem gave birth to Avraham, uh, sorry, Avraham gave birth to Yitzchak. Yitzchak's the son of Avraham. We only need to know the first time. Because Avraham represents Hashem's chesed. It represents Hashem's love, his kindness, what he really wants for you. Yitzchak represents givura, judgment, challenges, difficulties, obstacles. So what are we learning from this? A very deep secret. Hashem's love gives birth to those obstacles. Those obstacles are the offspring of Hashem's kindness. The reason we need the double language is because you would never think that Yitzchak is the son of Abraham. That's why the secret of the Midrash that says that what was the only proof that Yitzchak really was Abraham's son? The answer was because Yitzchak, if you looked very closely, you could see that Yitzchak looked just like Abraham. That for the person who has eyes to see, for the one who has received the teachings of the truth tzaddikim and has lived with these teachings, he could see very deep down that the face of Yitzchak is the same face of Abraham. Like King David said, that whether you're Yudke Bavke, I praise you, or whether you're Elohim, I praise you. Meaning, whether you're showing yourself to me in a way of kindness, or you're showing yourself to me in a way of sternness, they're both coming from the same place. The place of love. Like Rabbi Nachman teaches in the fourth Torah of Likut Moran. How do I know why Hashem is doing what He's doing to me? Is there any way I can get to the true motivation of it? Rabbi Nachman says yes, because there's only one true motivation for anything. When you say Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. Listen, Israel, meaning you. Listen. Hashem, which is Yud Kei Vav Kei, meaning His compassion, His love, His kindness. Elokeinu is our God, but Elokeinu represents His form of judgment, din, sternness, right? His hiding from us. Both of these things, Hashem, again, Yud Kei Vav Kei, Echad, it's all one. Now the word for Echad, Rabbi Nachman says, is the same gematria as Ahava, love. So really when you say, Shema Yisrael, listen to yourself, you're saying to yourself, arouse yourself, listen to what I'm saying. Hashem, meaning Hashem's kindness, Elokeinu, meaning Hashem's judgment, Hashem Echad, it's all Hashem, meaning it's all Ahava, it's all Echad, it's all coming from Hashem's love for you. That's the motivation for anything. So this is the only thing that you need to be thinking about. When I'm trying to grow, when I'm trying to elevate, when I'm trying to move beyond my circumstances, the only thing that you need to know is Hashem Echad, Hashem is one, meaning His motivation is love. However, only once you have done tshuva, only once you have actively worked to grow spiritually, are you going to be able to look in retrospect and to see how these challenges in your life actually served the purpose of Hashem's love and kindness. It's only once you do tshuva from love that you get to see the retroactive clarification of what was in the past. Okay. I hope everybody has an amazing week. I want everybody here before we move on to the Mishnah Melech. If you could look up the 25th lesson of Lekut Maran Tinyana, the second part of Lekut Maran. This is what the Shem, I'll send it to you guys afterwards. <clears throat> it's called the Rebbe's Letter. For the students of Rabbi Nachman. It's a very short, very short letter. Tremendous encouragement. Something that I, I really truly believe, especially in our generation, especially for these students right here, something that you should read at least once a day. 
25th lesson of the second part of Luke Tamaran. They call it the Rebbe's letter. Very short. But Rebbe Nachman is encouraging us in our life in the deepest way possible, the realest way possible. Look at that letter. Read it. Read it again. Read it again. Read it again. Let it sink in. Meditate on it. Cry about it. Pray about it. Sing about it. Fight for it. And Bezat Hashem, the next time that we come together, we are going to learn about the hero. We're going to learn about the one who takes out the lost princess. The Mishnah Melech. Everybody have an amazing, amazing week.